Let's sing a very familiar chorus, hymn number 154. For God so loved the world. We'll sing it through twice, hymn number 154.
time, the kids will be dismissed with Mr. Lee. Go ahead and follow him to the back walk. Thank you. At least they walk for about five steps. <laughs> and now we'll go ahead and have Brother Andy Seth come up at this time, sir. I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. And if you were in Sunday school, um, I appreciate Charlie's introduction into this message because at the end of Sunday school, uh, he preached a, uh, a, taught a lesson on faithfulness. And toward the end of that lesson, he got into the fact that uh, we need to be concerned. We have to have the right perspective, is the word Charlie used. We have to have that eternal perspective, that prophetic view, so to speak, and realize that uh, this home, this world that we live in, is not our home. It's not supposed to be. This is just preparation for the home to come, the life to come. So uh, with that in mind, in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says down in verse 11, Ephesians 6, 11, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places, I think too often that we forget we, it is a spiritual battle. And he's given us some tools to combat and be effective in that spiritual battle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, again, thank you for the day you've given us. As Charlie mentioned already, Lord, just the, the strength to be here this morning, the, the, the breath you've given us to breathe and, and the lives to live, Lord, another day to do something for you. Uh, another Lord's Day, Lord, that we might gather here together uh, surround your word uh, for the purpose of worshiping you and praising you and giving thanks to you through our singing, through our giving. And Lord, I pray as, as uh, we did in Sunday school that we'd learn something this morning. Help us to draw closer to you, Lord, that we might be better students of the word, better soldiers uh, for the cause of Christ, Lord, better servants for you and your purposes. And Lord, I just ask now that you minister to each and every uh, child in this room. Lord, uh, your children are precious in your sight, and Lord, I pray you bless them. Uh, Lord, we pray also that everything that's said and done would be pleasing in your sight and glorifying to you. And we ask it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. So continuing here, uh, Paul said, Wherefore, verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand in the evil days, and having done all to stand. Verse 14, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and then verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. That's the focus this morning. The focus that I want to preach on this morning is the powerful tool, the powerful weapon we have of prayer. Something we take much too lightly, we take it for granted. Now, if you were in Sunday school uh, as a young child, I wasn't. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I know one of the big things they always teach in Sunday school for the children is to put on the whole armor of God. It's a very you know, physical, demonstrable type message. And uh, oftentimes, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the whole armor of God, but they do mention seven specific items of armor here. But I think a more thorough reading of this will realize that uh, there's really an eighth part of the armor. It's just not mentioned. And if you know what a soldier, a Roman soldier, he had another part of the armor. He had a part called the leg greaves. And that was a part that actually, I think, covered the shin, 
covered up the kneecap. And maybe it's not mentioned here because maybe that soldier that uh, Paul was writing about was kneeling to pray. I don't know. But it says here in verse 18, praying always <coughs> with all prayer and supplication. Our prayer is definitely a most lethal tool, a weapon in our arsenal. The question is, are we taking advantage of it? Uh, you know, prayer is mentioned throughout our entire Bible. It starts in Genesis 4, where it says that man began to call upon the name of the Lord. And the very last word in our King James Bible is the word Amen. So all through this Bible, there's wonderful examples and admonitions about prayer. And I think part of our problem is that we live in a body of flesh, and it's much easier for us to get excited and relate to things that are physical, things that we can see, touch and taste and so forth. But folks, our spiritual battle is real. It's our most important battle, according to Paul. It's really our main battle is a spiritual battle. And we need to use the spiritual weapon of prayer to be victorious in that battle. Charles Stanley said this. He said, the shortest distance between a problem and its solution is the distance between our feet uh, excuse me, between our knees and the floor. And I like that. I, I, I want to ask you something. Uh, it's not a very big distance for you to get those knees on the floor. And maybe that's the solution oftentimes to your problems, my problems. Now, as an evangelist, uh, I spend a lot of time preaching, and hopefully I spend a lot of time praying. And most people that are in ministry, I know your pastor Price will tell you this, Charlie will probably, probably tell you this, Taj, uh, it is very, it's equally important that you prepare uh, by spending time in God's Word, but equally as important as the time you spend in prayer, preparing your heart, and hopefully getting close enough to God that you can hear from God so that He can give you the very words that He wants you to speak. The members of this church, and I don't know how many of you in this room this morning are, are members here, but if you're a regular attendee of this church, I would encourage you pray for your pastor. You should be praying diligently for Pastor Price, Charlie and Taj, and other people in leadership here, Brother Lee and his wife, because all throughout the scriptures, God makes it very clear that God speaks to groups of people <coughs> through a person. And he's given you a person. Uh, it's a Bible-believing preacher, Pastor Ryan Price, and he is... God's messenger to you. And if you really want to hear from God Sunday morning and Wednesday night, uh, I think you should be praying fervently throughout the week that uh, God would give your pastor the words that you need to hear. That's how God works. He works through a pastor. And as a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about uh, the gift you've been given of a, of a pastor teacher. It's a gift. That's what God calls your pastor teacher. He is God's gift to you. Take advantage of that gift. Support him by praying. Turn to James chapter 5. So right after the book of Hebrews, James chapter 5. I said, as an evangelist, I, I spend a lot of time preaching. And that, there's nothing wrong. Preaching is good. But preaching is temporal. It's done in time. Uh, it's usually done in public, in a pulpit. Uh, and it affects men. The Bible says it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. But I'll tell you what, prayer is maybe even more important. Why? Because prayer is eternal. And hopefully most prayer is done in a, in a private setting, a closet, a prayer closet. And it really does affect God. Praying affects God. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. But here in James uh, chapter 5, this is really the text for morning's message. This is a verse that if you don't have it committed to memory, uh, I hope maybe by the end of the message you'll have it memorized. I'll repeat it a bunch of times. James chapter 5, verse 16. Not so much the first part here which says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. This is the, these last ten words. This is something every Christian should commit to memory. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God's telling you, I mean, James written it by the power of the Holy Spirit that power is, comes with prayer. And if you are a fervent prayer warrior, 
then that, that, that will avail much. It will accomplish much. Uh, you say, well, I'm not righteous. The Bible says none is righteous, no, not one. Well, if you're born again, if you have Jesus Christ living inside of you, God's not talking about your righteousness in this example. Here. He's talking about the righteousness of Christ. So that's no excuse. You have no excuse saying, I'm not righteous. We know you're not righteous. I'm not righteous. None of us is. But we do have the righteousness of Christ if we're born again. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's take hold of that promise and use it for God's glory for our benefit. Okay, uh, turn to Genesis chapter 19. Let me give you an example of how prayer affects God. In Genesis 19, I'm going to give you the context while you get there. Uh, Abraham, God is using him to establish uh, the nation of Israel. And at some point, he had him lead uh, where he was and go to a far country. And he went, one of the ones, people he took with him was his nephew Lot. And at some point, Lot and Abraham divided ways. And uh, it said that Lot, I think, pitched his tent towards Sodom. Well, as we get into closer to chapter uh, 19, uh, an angel of the Lord is in, April, uh, in Genesis 18, an angel of the Lord is visiting Abraham and he's warning him, look at, I'm about to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness. And uh, I think he's telling Abraham that because Abraham's nephew Lot is there. Well, when Abraham hears this, he starts questioning this angel of the Lord, which is really the Lord. And he's saying, uh, Lord, uh, wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? And, and he says, you know, what about if there were 50 righteous people in that city? Would you destroy those 50 righteous along with the wicked? What about that, Lord? And the Lord says, well, no, if there were 50 righteous, I wouldn't destroy it. And we said, well, what if there was five less than that? What if it lacked five? And the Lord says, well, I, I guess I wouldn't have it lacked five. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Well, then he, gets down, he goes down to 40. Lord, what if there were 40? And then he goes down to 30. And he's just persistent. He keeps going, going, going. You know the story. He gets down to 10. He says, Lord, would thou destroy it if there was 10 righteous in that city? And that's kind of where he stopped. And the Lord said, no, I, I won't destroy it. You know what Abraham's doing there? He's talking to God. And that's what prayer is. It's you and I talking to God. And in this case, Abraham is talking on behalf of Lot to God. And that's what we call intercessory prayer, where you're interceding or praying on behalf of someone else for them. And that's powerful. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, here in Genesis 19, verse 22, this is uh, this Lord now, the Lord, the angel of the Lord is speaking now to Lot as he's pulled him out of the city. And he says to him, because he's actually had to pull him out of there, he says, haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come hither. And he's telling him, look at I'm under obligation. I really can't do anything until you leave. Why? Because he's not saying this in so many words, but we know from the context, it's that his uh, uncle, Abraham, has been interceding on his part. He's been praying for him. He's consciously talked to God about not destroying that city. <coughs> well, that's a great example of someone interceding. Uh, I will tell you this. When people love one another... They should be praying for one another. And if we do pray for one another, we should learn to love one another. We will learn to love one another more deeply. You can't hardly pray for somebody seriously, fervently, without caring for them. And you know, that is the great admonition in our Bible. We're told to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. That's the first and great commandment. We're not just uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, not just family, but everyone. We're told to love all kinds of people. And it's a really a, a good testimony about our salvation. So, prayer. It's powerful. It's effective. It affects not only God, but it affects eternity. It affects not only the person you're praying for, but it affects the person doing the praying. So it's, it's a win, win, win. Back in James chapter 5. 
Look how simple prayer can be sometimes. James chapter 5, we already read verse 16. Verse 17 says, Elias, talking about Elijah, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heat and the heaven gave rain, and the <coughs> earth brought forth her fruit. So here's a guy who sends up a simple prayer that it won't rain, and for, it doesn't rain for three and a half years. God answers prayer. And then he prayed again that it would rain, and sure enough, it starts raining. Uh, now that man walked with God. That man was close to God. And that, those, those <coughs> prayers were in line with God's will. Christian, are you praying? The effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you've done any studying in scriptures, uh, people that are in ministry, they're pretty familiar with a man named E.M. Bounds. And his, his, his whole niche in ministry was prayer. He's written several volumes on prayer. One of the things he said in one of his volumes is, the preacher who is not praying is playing. And the people who are not praying are straying. I think that's true. So it's an admonition for people that are in ministry. It's an admonition for people who aren't. It's an admonition for people. If you're not praying, your chances are you're straying. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, a very common verse, says, Pray without ceasing. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Christ said in the book of Luke, Watch ye therefore and pray always. We should be always in prayer. Uh, Christ said in the book of Matthew, Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Who in this room this morning doesn't want the peace of God? The peace of God that passes all understanding. I sure do. Be careful for nothing. We shouldn't have cares for uh, of anything. You know, there's a wonderful picture of that in the Old Testament. When those three Hebrew children uh, were getting ready to be tossed into the fiery furnace. And they knew that King Nebuchadnezzar uh, and promised that they didn't, they didn't bow down and worship to this graven image, that that's exactly what would happen to them. But they had purpose in their minds ahead of time that they would not do something contrary to what God had told them in this book, which is not to worship any graven images. So when Nebuchadnezzar personally came to them and said, this is what's going to happen, you're, you're going to get cast into that fiery furnace if you don't bow down and worship, and their immediate response to him was, we are not careful to answer thee concerning this matter. They'd already purchased their heart. They didn't have any cares about it. They didn't have to be careful or full of care. The Bible says here, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication that you request be made known unto God. Christian, are you praying? Another wonderful example is Samuel's mother, Hannah. If you're at all familiar with Samuel in the Old Testament, his mother, Hannah, was barren, and she grieved at not having a child. And she prayed fervently, the Bible says. As a matter of fact, it says in 1 Samuel 1.10 that she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord. She was in the temple one day, and, and uh, <coughs> Eli, the high priest there, saw her, heard her mumbling. She was actually praying. He thought she was drunk with wine, is what the Bible says because she was fervently praying to the Lord. Now, the Lord answered her prayers, and she bare a son named Samuel. And the name Samuel means asked of God. So Samuel, his name means asked of God. He knew that his very existence was the result of prayer. Do you think that affected him? I do. Because uh, toward the end of his life, 
as he was addressing the nation of Israel, reminding them that they were God's chosen people, and reminding them to turn from their evil ways because they were God's chosen. You know what he said? He said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He was so aware of the privilege and responsibility and power of prayer that he counted it a sin not to pray for this nation of Israel. Christian, you and I have been giving a tremendous tool. It's the tool of prayer, especially intercessory prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Uh, we need to take advantage of that power. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this. He said, prayer is a sacred pick lock that can open secrets and obtain great treasures. That's pretty neat. That, now he's an old-fashioned guy, and he spoke all that flowery, descriptive terminology. Prayer is a sacred pick lock that can open secrets and obtain great treasures. That's true. <laughs> Prayer is the key, the key to the, getting those treasures. You know, if you're familiar with Esther, Esther, uh, a Gentile, married a Jewish king, a Hazarus, and uh, she realized that uh, due to uh, wicked Haman uh, tricking the king into uh, signing this decree to destroy all the Jews, uh, she realized the responsibility kind of fell on her to approach the king and plead the case for the Israelites. All right? Well, she just couldn't charge into the king's presence without being summoned. And the Bible says that she fasted and prayed for three days so that when she did go in front of the king unsummoned, that he would hold up the golden scepter. Because if he failed to actually hold up that golden scepter, she could have been killed immediately, even though she was the queen. But she fasted and prayed. Now that's an example of someone spending a lot of time knowing that in advance the power of prayer could pave the way for her success. As a matter of fact, R.A. Torrey said this, the reason many people fail in battle is because they wait too long to prepare. The reason why others succeed is because they have gained the victory on their knees long before the battle began. Turn to Nehemiah. Old Testament, um, a few books before Job, which is before Proverbs, which is before Psalms. Psalms, Proverbs, uh, back in there. Nehemiah. Sandwich between Esther and Ezra. Nehemiah is a, a cupbearer for the king. And uh, the king's name is Artaxerxes. And it says that uh, Nehemiah comes before him one day. He's his cupbearer. And he's sad in his presence. And that's really not even allowed. You're not supposed to be sad in the presence of the king. You know, the king might, might get... Uh, just a bad feeling, I guess. He doesn't want anybody to be sad in his presence. It, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad, sheds bad light on the king. Like, why would you be sad around me? I'm a king. You should be happy just to be around me. The fact that you're alive and in my presence should make you happy. Well, Nehemiah comes before him and he's sad. Why? Because he's heard that uh, uh, his, his fellow Israelites are the ones that have... Uh, kept back from captivity. It says that uh, they were in a great affliction and reproach, and even the walls of Jerusalem, the city itself, is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So he's, he's distressed about the condition of his relatives and the Jerusalem and the temple and so forth. He comes in front of the king. The king asks him, uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4, the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request in other words, before that, I guess the context is he comes before the king, the king sees he's sad, he said, well, what's, what's the matter? He explained to him the situation. And the king said unto him, in verse 4, the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? 
So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, I'm just going to stop right there. I, I don't know if you, the point I'm trying to make is, the king, the king asked him a question, why are you sad? And so he, and then Nehemiah says, so I prayed, and then I said, now, again, we call this a Nehemiah prayer because it's, there's no time in between. It's like the king said something, I prayed, and then I said. It wasn't like there was this long, drawn-out thing, just the opposite of Esther. This is a Nehemiah prayer. So when in Thessalonians says, in every uh, pray without ceasing, we should always have that mindset of talking to God, and that is what prayer is, just talking to him. It's kind of, I don't know about you, I've got that, that mindset that when I wake up in the morning, you know, I thank God I'm alive another day. Give me the energy maybe to get up and do something. And more, you know, what wilt thou have me to do? Give me some energy to read my Bible, or whatever it may be. But you're kind of in a constant, continual state of talking to the Lord. Because he's real and prayer is powerful. So that's an example of a Nehemiah prayer. Uh, the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, the thing I like about Nehemiah and Esther is they made their prayers personal. It wasn't like, I don't know about you, but, you know, it was just last spring or summer, I don't know when that was, there was a huge storm that went over Houston and severely flooded Houston. I know it was less than a year ago. I don't recall exactly when it was. Um, so what do most of us do because we're so far removed from that? You might pray for those people and what they're going through. Uh, but how much more powerful would your prayer be is like, Lord, I understand what those people in Houston have gone through. Lord, what can I do for them? Can there something you can show me to do personally? <laughs> sure, pray for them. But I know we, we, uh, we know a church that lives in that area and the church survived pretty much, but they were They've had nonstop opportunities to minister ever since. I mean, they had a couple members whose, whose homes got destroyed. Of course, they helped them rebuild, but they reached out into the community and did all kinds of things. So we, we being too far away and being on the road, we just sent them a small love offering. And a few months later, we got a list of <coughs> all of the things that that church had done, some 30 different things specifically that they did with the funds from their own church and others like ourselves that had just invested a little money to doing, you know, allowing, knowing that they were in the area and they could do something practical with it. Now, I know all kinds of people that uh, left their businesses, left their homes, they went to that area because they had boats or they were good at construction or whatever it may be. But we need to pray and pray kind of proactively, not just, Lord, bless those people, be with them, comfort them, and that's all good. But boy, if we can put some kind of muscle to those prayers by, Lord, is there something I can do? You know, I'll tell you what. I know up in Nashville, Tennessee, where we were, there were people that were just, uh, businesses were gathering clothing to send as a group. You know, I mean, the local UPS store, the local car dealership, there's an RV dealership up there. They had a whole area where they were collecting clothing and blankets and toiletries and necessities, things like that to ship to a place like that. But do you know how God's going to prick your heart to do something like that? By you praying to God and asking Him. Making yourself available and then following through on it. Christian, are you praying? The effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In preparing for this message, I came across a man, I, I'm going to give him credit, his name's Ben Jennings. And I don't know much about him, but I, I, I really like what he wrote. <coughs> He wrote this, every prayerless day in the life of a Christian is a statement by a helpless individual, and that statement is, I do not need God today. Sounds pretty severe, but I, I think he's right on. If you're not praying to God, it's like telling him, hey, I don't need your help today. Now, I would be cautious about having that attitude, but that's the attitude we may display when he's given us such a powerful tool, the power of prayer, the tool of prayer, and we're not taking advantage of it. Ben Jennings said this, failing to pray reflects idolatry. It's a trust in substitutes for God. 
So instead of praying, we rely on our money instead of God's provision. Instead of praying, we rely on our own flawed thinking instead of God's wisdom. We take charge of our lives instead of trusting in God. And that's what it boils down to. God wants us to solicit our prayers through him. He wants to hear our prayers. And more than anything, he wants to, uh, to recognize when he does bless us with something we've requested, that he is the source of that blessing so that he can get the glory from it. Jennings said, prayerlessness short circuits the workings of God and neglecting prayer, therefore, is not a weakness. <coughs> it is a sinful choice. That's harsh. But what did Samuel say? God forbid that I should sin against God and ceasing to pray for you. I mean, this Ben Jennings guy, he's, he's right in line with Samuel. He's right in line with what the scriptures say. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. <coughs> The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation uh, that God created every human being and everything for his pleasure. So to put it in a nutshell, you and I created to bring God pleasure. He tells us in that verse, Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. For Thy pleasure they are and were created. He tells us in that verse that one of the ways we can please him is by glorifying him. And then he tells us in uh, John 15, 8, Jesus Christ said, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So, God created us to bring him pleasure. He gets pleasure when we glorify him. We glorify him when we bear fruit. And then in 2 Peter 1, 8, talking about us partaking of God's divine nature, he says, uh, if for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Talking about the sanctification process and the fact that we can bear fruit uh, by partaking of God's divine nature. So here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, <coughs> intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. <coughs> the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This is something, I mean, it's, a, it's a, not a suggestion. That's a, a commandment, a requirement. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men men. That's saved, lost, relatives, whatever. I think the word intercession, you'll find it nine times in our Bible. Nine is the number of fruitfulness. And I think it is the key to the fruitful Christian life. You want to bear fruit for the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ? You want to stand him before God one day at the judgment seat of Christ? That works that will survive that fiery trial as, as uh, gold, silver, and precious stones? then we need to take advantage of a powerful tool of prayer. It's a spiritual battle. And you and I uh, have an obligation to get busy for the Lord doing something by bathing it in prayer. I think when we work as individuals, we can get some things done, and, and that's all good. But when we pray, <coughs> God works. And then when we pray and work, God works through us. And that's the best combination. God has given us the gift of prayer. It was never meant to be a burden, but rather it's a, a source of unlimited blessing for us and those around us. Don't think of the time that you spend on prayer as, as something that, that's just a necessity. I mean, it is a necessity, but it's, it shouldn't be a negative thing. It should be a positive thing. Take advantage of it. It's just, it's like the words of God, you know, it's a, an incredible, powerful tool as well. But if you're not reading them, th that, th that tool's not doing you much good. These also effectually work in those that believe the words of God. They're pure words. Between those words and our spiritual uh, obligation to pray, 
we could we should be able to allow the Lord to use us to do something really special. Christian, I want you to think of it this way. Every day we have another opportunity to affect our very future. How do we do that? With the words that we speak to God. You and I have an important task, several tasks. God didn't save us just so he could spend eternity out with us in heaven. God saved us so that he could sanctify us, process us, turn us into that vessel unto honor, and then use us day by day to serve other people. He wants to use us so that people will see him working through us. If we just yield to him. And a lot of that has to do with our responsibility to pray. <coughs> the effectual and fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time you've given us this morning. Lord, help us not to neglect the uh, responsibility of prayer, praying for brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, praying for the lost world out there, praying for wisdom and knowledge, praying for the peace of God that passes all understanding. Lord, there's so many things we could pray for, but help us to pray for the little things and the big things alike, Lord, and then to give you uh, the thanks and the glory when you honor those requests, Lord. And if you don't answer our prayers according to our, our desire at that time, help us to recognize, Lord, that that's, that's your perfect will. And maybe you're keeping us from something we don't really need, something we just want. So, Lord, I pray we'd be sensitive to your leading in all areas of our life. Help us to be better prayer warriors. Help us to pray, especially for pastor of this church, Lord, that he may continue to be the man of God that you would have this church to hear from. Lord, watch over him, protect him, especially as he travels home uh, during this day and this evening. Lord, and just give him the strength and the courage to continue this ministry here in Fort Lauderdale, as well as the work he's doing in Miami Beach and other places as well. Lord, we love you. We thank you for saving our souls and allowing us to worship and serve a God that not only hears prayer, but answers it as well. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I don't know, I'm going to turn it over to Taz here, and uh, you guys close your service. Thank you for that message, Brother Ang Seth, about prayer. For our dismissing song, if you will, go ahead and stand, and we'll sing one verse, so tell it to Jesus. <coughs> number 347. Tell it to Jesus. We'll sing the first verse, we'll pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we had to come to your house today and listen to your word, Lord. God, thank you for the ability that we even have to speak to you, to talk to you, to pray to you. And thank you for being so loving to listen to us. And God, I just pray that we recognize how important prayer is. We recognize how the fervent prayer of a righteous man does avail much. And I pray that we will strive, dear Lord, to pray without ceasing, to pray for others, to pray for our needs, dear Lord, to communicate with you. I just pray that we'll be able to apply that throughout the day, not only today, but the weeks in the months to come and even just in our lives that way we can grow and have a stronger relationship with you as we ought to be with us as we dismiss be with pastor price and mrs price they're on the way back we love you lord pray everyone will be back tonight for the message of your word we pray in your name amen thank you guys for coming be sure to be back tonight you guys are dismissed Thank you.